My name is Johanna Wagstaff. I'm a meteorologist and an earth scientist. Every day, I see the effects of climate change through my work, a relentless cycle of extreme weather, terrifying storms, deadly heat domes, wildfires, droughts. But I remain in awe of the natural world and how it finds ways to adapt. And that's what we explore on Planet Wonder. Okay, did you remember your passport? Did you turn off all the lights? Do you have your book? Is your phone charged? Turns out, it takes a single drop of water about 1,000 years to travel around the world. We also know global warming is changing everything. So that got me wondering, how is climate change messing with the motion of the ocean? Oceans are all about movement, and it starts with sucking in CO2. And there is a lot of extra CO2 in our atmosphere right now, higher levels than at any time in the past 400,000 years because of burning fossil fuels. Now, a bunch of it, as we know, just hangs out in our atmosphere for a long, long time, heating our planet up by creating a giant greenhouse. Some of it is taken up by plants through photosynthesis. Thank you, trees but a huge amount ends up in our oceans. Oceans absorb 30 to 50% of the CO2 produced by burning fossil fuels. Without our oceans, global warming would have already made the planet a lot warmer. How exactly does the ocean consume carbon? First, through basic chemistry. It's just carbon dioxide dissolves in water. H2O plus CO2 equals H2CO3. This is carbonic acid, which literally just breaks apart and reforms as bicarbonate, which is stored in shells and bones of marine organisms. The other way the ocean eats CO2 is through photosynthesis by phytoplankton, which are microscopic plant-like organisms. They generate about half the oxygen in the atmosphere, as much per year as all plants on land. But of course, there is a limit to how much CO2 the ocean can take in. To understand how the ocean is already changing, I connected with Simon Donner, an ocean scientist and climate change communicator who often commutes to work in his kayak. First, he's going to explain the three main ways water moves in our oceans, surface currents, vertical mixing, and the global conveyor belt. Simon, thank you for joining me on a beautiful winter kayak day. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty great, right? It is great. It's a little nippy, but it's great. <laughs> yes. What are all the different ways that the ocean moves? Well, th there's really two main ways that the ocean circulates. The first is what you would feel if you're out like in a sailboat, which is the movement of the water on the surface. And that's just being driven by the winds and by the fact that the planet's rotating. Right. And so it's like a flu, you know, the ocean's a fluid on top of a rotating surface. Wait, I want to know more. Let's go down the rabbit hole. Did you know that an ocean accident inspired scientists and storytellers to learn more about how ocean currents work? So this is a video excerpt from a book by Christiane Dorian called How the World Works. In 1992, a ship carrying cargo from Hong Kong to Seattle ran into stormy weather, an Aleutian low likely in January. 28,000 rubber ducks were lost overboard and oceanographers jumped on the chance to understand more about how surface ocean currents work. So they asked beachcombers all around the world to stay tuned for those rubber ducks. Later that year, those ocean currents carried the first rubber duck to the shores of Alaska. There it is, first rubber duck, hi. And since then, hundreds of ducks have followed those ocean currents all over the world. A lot of them are still ending up on shores. And we're still learning a lot about how ocean currents work. So if you find a rubber duck, it might just be part of the great accident slash great experiment. There's another way that the ocean moves that is really surprising, and it's driven all by like the density of water. So you've got water that's uh, some water that's warmer and that floats a little bit more. You've got water that's, uh, that's got more salt in it and that's denser. And because of that, there's some parts of the ocean where that new deep water gets created and sinks. 
And that sinking motion causes this slow overturning of the ocean that takes like thousands of years. In a minute, we'll connect ocean motion and climate change. But first, we wanted to ask what you know about all the ways the ocean moves. What I understand is I think it's uh, guided by somehow the moon. So I was thinking I know the moon has yeah. a big part to do with it. That's good. Thank you. Gravity. Thank yeah. You. I think the ocean moves with currents. Any guesses on the different ways that the ocean moves? Yeah. This is actually a jar of the layers of the ocean. So it actually mixes up and down. So it moves up and down as well. Did you know that? Nope, I didn't. Can you kind of show us how you think it might mix? Uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that's good. That's that's good. The tumbler motion and then the big conveyor belt. Yeah. That's good. That's good. That's good. And then yeah, that's good. <laughs> yes. I think it would mix vertically. Rather, you take two liquids, one's denser than the other. I'm pretty sure the more denser liquid would sink to the bottom. The less dense liquid would sink on top, would go on top. Basically, it'll go like, let's say you poured it in, it'll go. Well, you nailed it. How, how is this body of water connected to all the oceans around the world? I mean, the oceans obviously are all connected. But there's this grand movement of water that takes thousands of years, and it's because of these differences in density. And, and people call it the, the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. Uh, scientists call it the thermal haline circulation. And what it is is that there are some parts of the ocean, particularly in the North Atlantic, where the water is denser at the surface. It's cold and it's salty, and so water sinks in that part of the ocean. What are all the different ways that climate change is impacting the ocean right now? So, I mean, one of the main ones, obviously, is that as the planet's warming, the ocean is absorbing a lot of extra energy, like 93% of all that extra heat being trapped by greenhouse gases is going into the ocean, right? So we know the ocean is warming. The ocean's also rising, and some of that's because we're melting ice on land, but it's also just because warmer water is less dense and expands, and so that's causing sea level rise as well. Okay, hold that thought. This is an art installation under the Canby Bridge, but it's also based on the latest science from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for sea level projections. So if we were to see the majority of the ice around the world melt and the waters warm as a result of climate change, we could be looking at a four to six meter sea level rise globally. Here in False Creek, they're taking a middle of the road scenario. This is five meters, a five meter sea level ride if we see the tipping point of our ice sheets around the world melt. Now, we're already seeing the impacts of climate change. And in fact, here in Vancouver, by 2050, a 50 centimeter sea level rise. Now, that might not look like much, but we get glimpses into this future every time we get a storm surge or a king tide that pushes water levels up 50 centimeters and we see our infrastructure destroyed. Based on a middle of the road scenario, we're talking a one meter rise globally by 2100 and double that by 2200. So you got te temperature warming, you got sea level rise. We also have the ocean is losing oxygen. And when you have warmer water at the surface, it means there's a big difference in density between that surface water and the deep water, and the two don't mix very well. And so oxygen that normally would diffuse out of the atmosphere and mix into the deep ocean can't get there. What does that, those oxygen changes mean for marine life? When you have low oxygen, oxygen levels in, in water, particularly in the deep waters, really fish can't survive. And the other one is the ocean is becoming more more acidic basically and it's all it's because of the direct effects of carbon dioxide so you don't even need the climate to change for this mm -hmm. to happen it literally is from us putting more carbon dioxide in the air some of that carbon dioxide dissolves into the water changes the chemistry of the ocean and leads uh, to the water becoming a little bit more on the acidic end of the range there's all these organisms in the ocean that, that need uh, a certain balance of carbon chemicals to build their skeleton rabbit hole time so this cup of ocean water probably contains between 75 and 100 million phytoplankton, all just photosynthesizing, turning CO2 into oxygen. These 
are our phytoplankton. The phytoplankton get eaten by the cinnamon bun center, aka zooplankton, and they're just going to town on the phytoplankton at all times, just stuffing themselves with carbon. The zooplankton then get eaten by bigger fish. So the carbon is traveling up the food chain. All right, here you go. Eat your zooplankton. Okay, the fish then gets eaten by a bigger marine animal, like a whale. For these purposes, I'd like to be a humpback whale. I'm going to eat a giant carbon stuffed fish. It's good carbon. Mm. Now, if any one of us dies, the carbon in our bodies will float down to the ocean floor. That's called marine snow. And it gets buried under the ocean dirt where that carbon remains trapped for millions of years. Oh. If a whale dies, it's a big deal. It's called a whale fall. The whale body is just full of carbon and it takes that carbon from the upper levels of the ocean all the way down to the bottom of the seafloor. We're up to 60 different species then have those nutrients and that carbon in places where they normally wouldn't get it. This is why scientists say whales are a vital part of marine life. So the best example are tropical corals. So the more CO2 dissolves in the water, the balance of all these carbon chemicals changes and it makes it harder and harder for corals and other shell-forming organisms to build those shells. Simon, so, mean, can you show us what acidification looks like in the ocean? Hold on a second, we're too far. I know, show. we're gonna keep drifting. We'll, we'll... Yeah. So, I mean, can you show us what acidification looks like in the ocean? Well, if anyone who has a carbonated beverage is basically experiencing acidification, because when you make a carbonated beverage, you're basically taking CO2 that's usually in a gas canister in like a home seltzer machine, and you're just exposing this high concentration of CO2 to water. You quickly seal the can, yeah. and that CO2 goes into dissolved form, so you don't see any bubbles. But when you open the bottle, you hear I that, heard it. <laughs> you start seeing bubbles coming out. Yeah. That is the CO2 going back into gaseous form, going back up into the atmosphere. What does that do for the shells of animals and corals? I mean, I know, I know this is, you know, a big part of your research. Yeah, so, so uh, tropical corals, but all sorts of other organisms in the oceans build their shells using these carbon compounds that are in the ocean. But when we add more CO2 to the water, it changes the balance of all those carbon compounds. And as a result, it makes it harder for organisms to build their shells. And if the concentration gets high enough of the wrong carbon compounds, they actually will lead to things dissolving. And so one of the threats going into the future is that corals and other shell forming organisms are gonna build their skeleton slower but also might get to the point that they're literally just dissolving being in the water. Lots of scientists around the world are studying how all those underwater changes affect marine life. But to start, they need to know precisely where that marine life is. Eugenie Jacobson, show me your laboratory. Hi, my name is Eugenie, and this summer I boarded a ship with 40 scientists and 40 Coast Guard crew members. We started our trip a little bit later this year at the beginning of September in Quebec City, and we traveled through the Labrador Sea up along the coastline, then across to Greenland, and then up into the Northwater Polynia at the very top. We use fancy fish finders to locate the fish, but we really don't know what we're catching. That's why we deploy nets to see what species live where. We use a double square net to look at the zooplankton. Nets actually have different mesh sizes, and they can section are different zooplankton into different categories. We also use what's called a multi-net plankton sampler or a hydrobios. And the hydrobios closes at different parts of the water column to look for different types of zooplankton. 
This one turned out really cool. Then once we want to find fish, we use what's called a midwater trawl, which goes down into the twilight zone of the ocean, which is about 200 to 1,000 meters. And so before we look at the fish finder to see where they might be living. We also catch a lot of zooplankton and we have to sort those out too. The fan favorite is the beam trawl and that samples our demersal fish, so our bottom dwelling fish. Using baited and drop cameras, we found some pretty interesting organisms on the seafloor. The first one were these arctic cod, which are one of my study fish. Uh, we also found eels, <laughs> found anemones, this one got stung, a tinafore, and a lot of other gelatinous uh, plankton, an octopus, a Greenland shark with the parasite in its eye, a squid, not one, but two squids that were found with the drop camera, a Greenland halibut, which is a cool flatfish, a halosaur, which sounds like dinosaur, and of course, it wouldn't be a trip to the Arctic without seeing a polar bear. We have a lot of questions when it comes to climate change and the Antarctic Sea. On the one hand, from space, it actually looks like the continent is growing because changes in weather patterns actually means more snow. But on the other hand, underneath the continent, warm currents are eating away at the ice sheets and glaciers from the bottom up. And this could lead to massive changes in sea level rise. And we've just had our first real piece of evidence of one of these warm currents by none other than a submarine named Bodie McBoatface. No, really. So back in 2016, the United Kingdom Natural Environment Research Council asked the public to name their $200 million research vessel. Naturally, we voted on Bodie McBoatface and the UK government was like, uh, we're gonna go ahead and call our ship the Sir David Attenborough, also good name, but we're gonna give you this autonomous submarine. We'll call that Bodie McBoatface that'll live on board. We seem content with that. This is what happens when you let the internet name things. Now the Filchner Rhone ice shelf is actually the largest floating extension of the Antarctic ice sheet by volume. Underneath we know the ocean is cold and dense, but we also know that we would expect to see one of these warm currents and our climate models show eventually we'll see a tipping point and that ice could melt. Q Bodie McBoatface who dove down under the ice sheet and gave us our first observations of this single warm current that could eventually lead to the full collapse and melting of this big ice sheet. Now more observations are needed, but stay tuned for more work from Bodie McBoatface that'll help us understand the tipping points that happen in Antarctica. Simon, how is climate change messing with the motion of the ocean? Well, there are two ways that, that worry me. The first is that as the surface of the ocean gets warmer, the, there's a bigger difference between the temperature in the surface and the temperature in the deep ocean. And that means it's kind of like oil and water. The two don't mix very well. And so as the surface keeps getting warmer, there's less mixing of the surface and the deep waters. And part of the reason that matters is that mixing is how we get oxygen into the deep ocean. And so it's a really big problem for marine life all around the world. Pause, 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 pause. It's not just oxygen affecting marine life. It's also that warmer water forces fish and other sea creatures to migrate to cooler water just to survive. William Chung studies exactly that. William, thank you so much for joining me for a sushi meal. Oh, that's great. This meal is going to look very different in the next 10 to 20 years because of climate change. So can you sort of take me through some of the most popular items, mm -hmm. starting with, you know, everyone's favorite, the salmon? Exactly, yeah. I mean, here salmon, uh, we have two types. We have farm salmon and we have wild caught salmon as well. Uh, you can quite easily distinguish it because uh, farm salmon uh, often and almost always have uh, is more fatty. So this is uh, a farm salmon. Exactly, and, and here it is also lighter in color mm. uh, compared to the uh, wild caught salmon. Uh, okay, which I'm going to try a bite yes. of the wild salmon. Exactly, yeah. Certainly climate change is one of the contributing factors uh, that lead to uh, the decline of, uh, of, of sockeye salmon. What about tuna? Now this is also a classic. Let's give this one a go. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorites, actually. Yeah. Okay. We can't go wrong with tuna. How is this going to change with climate change? So tuna is one of the species that uh, has uh, shown um, large scale changes in the distributions um, throughout the world. Um, is again, it's because of changing ocean conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, Albacore tuna is uh, more frequently um, seen and uh, being abundant in British Columbian waters. Interesting. Um, and now seaweed. I mean, it's a side staple. I'm going to give this one a go. Tell me how, how this has been affected. Yeah, seaweed is, uh, I mean, uh, lives in coastal waters. Uh, 
So the temperature sometimes becomes too hot for them, uh, and so there can be mass mortality of seaweed along the coast. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it is um, also a species that has uh, a low carbon footprint. Yes. And uh, in fact, uh, if for some of the seaweed, they can actually contribute to carbon sequestration mm -hmm. because uh, they do photosynthesis, uh, they absorb carbon dioxide, capture the carbon from the atmosphere, and then if they um, do uh, various uh, oceanographic process, get buried into the, uh, the seafloor, then um, the, uh, the carbon that are captured by the seaweed can be stored there for a long time. Seaweed will, is both a climate change solution and in turn we'll see more of it on the menus in the future. Yes. Well, it's a good thing. It is quite delicious. It is, yeah. <laughs> but the other one is has been a big concern for years, particularly for Western Europe, is what happens if this great overturning of the ocean slows down. And the reason that, that can happen is because the water in the North Atlantic, where a lot of that deep water forms, uh, is getting a little bit less salty because of the addition of fresh water um, due to climate change. And it means that the, th there's a little less power to this overturning circulation. So this, this idea that the, the great ocean conveyor belt could slow down is where the movie The Day After Tomorrow came from. Because if we melted enough ice and added... The whole damn shelf is breaking off. The whole damn shelf is breaking off! I just had to say my favorite line from the movie. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so if you, if you melted enough ice from land and added all this fresh water to the North Atlantic, it is possible that the thermohaline circulation would, would stop or slow down this great ocean conveyor belt. The movie, though, is completely preposterous. It defies mm -hmm. the laws of physics. And that's the worry, that if it does slow down in hundreds if not thousands of years from now it might change the climate of parts of the world as we know it yeah absolutely and so the 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 ocean conveyor belt is part of what keeps western europe so warm compared to the same latitudes here in canada uh, and if if the thermohaline if this great ocean conveyor belt slowed down or stopped entirely it could lead to cooling and wet cooling in that part of the world but the scenario in the movie that's not real i, I didn't do anything So despite all of this, Simon, you remain incredibly optimistic. I've heard you say, though, that it's actually more about courage. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm optimistic that we can do a lot to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to help, you know, save what's happening to the ocean and happening to people around the world. Uh, but I think what we really need is guts right now. We need the courage to go from the kind of incremental actions we're taking to the really transformational ones. How do you make somebody care about the ocean who, you know, doesn't have access to it? Yeah, and I mean, listen, we're fortunate to live out here on the West Coast and be able to walk down or, you know, paddle on the ocean every day. The thing is, we are on a water world. I mean, if it wasn't for the water that makes up three quarters of the, covers three quarters of the earth, there wouldn't be life on the planet. And so, I, I just think that the ocean is so much part of part of the world that we just really can't escape it. Yeah, and I'm escaping you right now. Yeah. <laughs> We're drifting into yeah. the boat a little yeah, bit. Yeah, hang on. There are some courageous efforts to improve ocean life. Youth ambassadors with OceanWise gathered in Vancouver's Stanley Park to remove harmful invasive seaweed. It's called Sargassum muticum or wireweed. It's from Japan. It's come over through shipping. Divers are tracking marine microalgae in the Arctic Ocean in Nunavut to understand the effects of climate change. And a group in Nova Scotia is replanting eelgrass. This can be envisioned as an underwater reforestation project, but for a very special ecosystem. Our planet is 71% ocean, but for many of us, it doesn't feel that way, especially if we don't interact with it every day. But the oceans are this planet's immune system. And climate change is messing with that. We can stop the worst of those changes from happening if we act now and with courage. As marine biologist Rachel Carson says, the more clearly we focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe around us, the less taste we shall have for destruction.
Okay, Wesley, are you yes. ready to make an ocean, yeah. the layers of the ocean in a jar? Yeah! Yeah! So we're gonna start with the deepest layer in the ocean and we're going yeah. to use corn syrup, the <laughs> darkest trench layer. Oh, you still have syrup in here. Let's just pour that in. No, I need to drink it. Okay, now we're gonna do the midnight zone midnight and we're just gonna use straight water, cooking oil. Cooking oil. Hey, I'm starting to see the separation. See that? Is that water? Uh, this is not water. The top layer is rubbing alcohol. It's a beer. It's kind of like beer. It's vodka. A pilot fish sniffed your leg once. But I didn't see it. What were you doing in the midnight zone? 